So let's go ahead and get our class going tonight. Hopefully everybody did their homework assignment and read Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. I always think it's kind of funny when I give a, a um, homework assignment that's just eight verses and say make sure that you read that because it's not a whole lot of reading, but I hope that we all got to do that. We're going to go through those verses this evening and talk about the things that are here. We spent two classes talking about an introduction to Revelation. If you didn't get to listen to those, I'd highly encourage you to go back and listen to those videos. They are on our Facebook page. All you have to do is go to the video section and you can find them there to get that introductory material. Let's go ahead and pull up uh, the first chart that we've got tonight, maybe, if I can get my computer to do it. There we go. Um, remember that when we talked last class, we talked about the overall structure of the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation divides very neatly into two parts. There's chapters 1 through 11, then there's chapters 12 through 22. Both parts of the book of Revelation tell the same story, they just tell it from a different perspective. And so this evening, we're starting out uh, here at the very beginning, at that first part of the book, chapters 1 through 11, the struggle on the earth and we saw as we looked at that structure we broke that down the first three chapters are christ among the lampstands tonight specifically we find ourselves in chapter one looking at christ so that's where we're going to be let me also point out to all of y'all that i do have my ipad on my desk beside me opened up to the facebook live presentation so if you have some questions or comments that you'd like to ask please go ahead and ask those in the comment section on the live feed and I'll see those and I'll try to answer those questions as we go. I don't want this just to be a lecture. I know that we won't get to hear your voice if you have a question, uh, but I will repeat your question if you, and, uh, and, and we'll spend some time talking about it because I do want to have that interaction. My classes typically have a lot of interaction and we kind of lose that in this format, but there's not a whole lot we can do with that right now. So let's go ahead and get to... Uh, the class itself, looking at Revelation chapter 1, 1 through 8. Very specifically, I'd like us to start off by reading verses 1 through 3. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. This is what we read. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. When we start talking about the book of Revelation, we start looking at these three verses, these first three verses, one thing that I want us to do is I want us to note a point of contrast or comparison between the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. In the book of Revelation, uh, we read something. We just read it. We're going to get to that in a second. But in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28, we read about that vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And Daniel gives the interpretation of the vision. And in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28, speaking of the events of that vision, specifically the establishment of that kingdom, and that kingdom is going to fill the whole earth, Daniel is told, or what Daniel tells us, is that God has made known what will be in the latter days. So in the days of Daniel, in the context of this vision, God tells Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel that God has made known what's going to happen in the latter days. It's going to happen a long time from now, Nebuchadnezzar. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen well down the road. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, I want to go back and look at this again. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, we read the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. I want us to note the contrast. Daniel chapter 2 verse 28. The thing of the vision, it's going to happen much later. It's going to be fulfilled much later on. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, John is told, John tells us, he tells his readers that these are things that must soon take place. The vision, the vision of Daniel chapter 2 is not just that a kingdom uh, will be set up, but that it will endure forever. Hold your place there in Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to run very quickly over to, uh, over to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. Now, we usually focus on that part of the verse about the establishment of the kingdom. Notice the rest of the verse. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So the vision of Daniel chapter 2 is not just that a kingdom is going to be set up, but that it is going to endure 
forever. And that's important because that's what the book of Revelation is about. It's not about the establishment of the kingdom. We get that in Acts chapter 2. It's about the fact that the kingdom is going to endure forever. So as we look at the time frame, what we need to understand is that in Daniel, the visions are talking about things that are distant future. But by the time we get to the book of Revelation, what's being talked about is near future. A lot of folks ignore that. A lot of folks just kind of gloss over those things that we've read and said, no, 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 no. Revelation is about all these things that's going to happen uh, at the end of time. Uh, it's still future for us. People are talking, oh, the rapture is going to happen and things like that. That's not what the book of Revelation tells us. The book of Revelation tells us these are things that are going to soon take place. Now, I want you to understand that the vision in Daniel chapter 2 is talking about things that would happen in about 600, 650 years. If Revelation chapter 1 says it's going to take place soon, how in the world can we think that these are still going to be things that are 2,000 years some odd after the fact that the book of Revelation was revealed. So we need to remember the time frame that's going on here. Um, just let's note some other things here about this. We get this emphasized elsewhere in the book of Revelation that these are events of the near future. So we already read chapter 1 and verse 1, the things that must soon take place. Then we get in the, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 6, in chapter 22 and verse 6, we read what must soon take place. Then we go back to chapter 1 and verse 3 that we also read, where we read that the time for the time is near. You can go ahead and go back to Revelation chapter 1 uh, if you'd like to and look at that again. Verse 3, the time is near. It's at the very end of that verse. Then we jump back over to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10. And what we read there is the time is near. And so we see here primarily in chapter 1, but also in chapter 22. That's the first chapter and the last chapter of the book of Revelation that the emphasis is on the fact that these are events of the near future. The near future for John. The near future for those who are reading the book of Revelation straight from him. Also, with just kind of note here as well, something about the difference between sealed and open. Look with me. Uh, well, if you don't want to turn there, that's fine. I'm going to go very, very quickly over to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel is told here at the end of the book, he says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So Daniel receives these visions, and he's told to seal up the book until the time of the end. Now look with me, if you would, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10, John gets very different instructions. And he said to me, this is Revelation chapter 22, in verse 10, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy in this book for the time is near. That's that phrase we talked about just a moment ago. So Daniel is told to seal up the book. John is told don't seal up the book. Why? Because in the case of the revelation, these are things that are soon to take place. Chapter 22 and verse 6. So the events of the book of Revelation were near future for Christians then, they are distant past for Christians today. So what was future for the Christians in John's day is past for us, with an exception that we're about to talk about, okay? So as we, look about, as we think about these events of the near future, not everything mentioned in Revelation would be fulfilled immediately. The war that's described in the book is an ongoing war, and victory over Rome, though, is going to be near. So Daniel, these things are a long way off. John, these things are near. Do they happen in one day? No. Do they happen in one year? No. It's going to take a couple of hundred years but in terminology of the folks that are living there, that's near future because the war is ongoing. Now, there's two other things that we find in the book of Revelation. We find Revelation chapter 20 and 21. And maybe you've already kind of thought about that, where in Revelation chapter 20 and 21, we read about the final judgment. We read about heaven. We read about the lake of fire. And we say, well, how is that near? Well, I'm going to suggest to you, and we're going to get to this at, certainly as we get to that point in the class, that these chapters 
are pointing to the final judgment, which is still future for all of us, for the people of John's day and for us as well. The purpose, though, in having these in the book is to show the ultimate hope of these saints and consequently us. So we kind of get this fast forward, if you will, where God is showing not only the victory over Rome, not only the fact that the church, the kingdom is going to be victorious, but he also points to that eternal victory that still awaits all of us. But how we understand chapter 20 and 21 being still future doesn't negate the fact in the context of the book that the events that are being talked about are events of the near future. So that's something that's important for us to talk about as we get into the book of Revelation. We didn't do that in the introduction because I knew we'd do it here in these eight verses. So let's go ahead and look on, go ahead and go back to Revelation chapter one. Uh, and we're gonna now pick up the reading. We read verses one through three. Let's go ahead and pick up the reading in verse four. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness I'm sorry I'm reading the wrong verses I need to go back to verse 3 we're not done with verse 3 just yet uh, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. I want to just point out before we look at verses four and five that there are some blessings that are pronounced in the book of Revelation. And when if I were teaching this class in person, you'd have a set of handouts and I'd want you to go in and write down what these blessings are because we're not able to do that. I'm just going to give them to you. So in chapter one and verse three, what we read there was, there is a blessing on the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and a blessing on those who hear and who keep what is written in it. Then in chapter 14 and verse 13, we have yet another blessing. Let's go over there and look at that. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. And I saw a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their deeds for their deeds follow them. So here we have another blessing. The blessing is pronounced upon the dead who die in the Lord from now on. In chapter 16 and verse 15, we will get to this later in the class as well, but there's another blessing upon the one who stays awake keeping his garments on. Then in chapter 19 and verse 9, we read that there is a blessing on those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's an interesting thing that we'll talk about when we get to chapter 19. Not necessarily the kind of supper that we might think about, but uh, one that's described there nonetheless. So yet another blessing. As we look on in chapter 20 and verse 6, there is a blessing pronounced upon the one who shares in the first resurrection. Then in chapter 22 and verse 7, a blessing upon the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then finally in verse 14 of the same chapter, yet another blessing upon those who wash their robes. Now, I know we moved through those very quickly. And I don't know if you were counting them or not. I kind of hope that you were. Because if you were counting them, you should have counted, you should have counted seven. Remember, in the introduction, we talked about how numbers are important in Revelation. The number seven is woven throughout the book of Revelation. Of course, seven is a number that represents perfection, completeness, and it is woven in the structure of the book. We see lots of sevens, and we see seven blessings, and they're not all in one place. So we find those blessings by hunting through the book of Revelation and seeing that phrase and indeed in the book of revelation there are seven blessings that are pronounced and we saw each of those uh, in these two slides and of course we're going to come to them as we go through the text itself now let's go ahead and move on and look at verses four and five let's look at verse four first uh, i'm going to turn in my bible back over there so revelation chapter one and verse four um, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Let's just stop right there and read only verse 
4. So in this verse, we have a salutation, pretty typical. Most New Testament letters have a salutation. Uh, it's a greeting to the person that's being written to. In this case, the greeting is from John, but it's not just John because John is recording information that's given to him from God. So here in the salutation, the first part of the salutation, we have a salutation from God the Father. And he is described here in the text as him who is and who was and who is to come. That's a pretty significant phrase. And when you think about this, remember I said in the introduction that there are lots of allusions in the book of Revelation back to the Old Testament and specifically a lot to the book of Genesis um, and the first five books of the Bible. You may remember you may remember when uh, God appears to Moses in the burning bush that Moses wants to know, well, who is it that's sending me back to the people of Israel? When they ask, who, who sent you? I need to be able to tell them. God identifies himself as I am. He's using uh, a Hebrew terminology there that's coming from a verb, which is the verb to be. And what's interesting is then we get to the book of Revelation and God the Father is identified as him who is, okay, him who was, and who is to come. He's talking about his eternal nature, okay, who is, so he's in the present, who was, that's the past, who is to come, that's the future. It really takes us back to how God identifies himself to Moses at the burning bush. I would also ask you to note here as we look at the verse that God here is pictured as being seated on the throne. Look at the very last part of verse 4, who are before his throne. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, positionally, God is on the throne. Now, we, as under, we understand as Christians that Jesus sits upon the throne of David, but positionally in the book of Revelation, the Father, God the Father, is depicted as being on the throne. Well, the salutation here in verse 4 is not just from God the Father. It's also from God the Spirit. He's identified here as the seven spirits, the seven spirits who are before his throne. There is yet another seven. Now note in conjunction with this, Revelation chapter 4, hold your place there in Revelation chapter 1. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and, be and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Look with me in chapter 5 and verse 6. Chapter 5 and verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns. There we got seven again. And seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, the seven spirits which are before his throne. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5, again the seven spirits. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, again the seven spirits. Seven is talking about completion or perfection. I would suggest to you that this is God's way in the book of Revelation of identifying the Holy Spirit. Now look with me if you would. Or just listen as I read. Let's go to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, it's in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets. It is apocalyptic literature. It's one of the Old Testament apocalyptic books. So it's in the same genre as the book of Revelation. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 1. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right on the, of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and you shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. 
Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. So in Zechariah, you get seven lamps. You get seven eyes, which range through the earth. Go back and look with me again at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. What do we see there? The lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. This is a point of reference between the book of Zechariah and what we're reading here in Revelation. It's a reference to God the Spirit. Note also in regard to this, we're just going to read this very, very briefly. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. If you've got your Bibles open there to Isaiah, and I realize I may have read that before you could get there, notice we read the Spirit of the Lord, verse 2. Then we get Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit of wisdom, Spirit of understanding. Spirit of counsel, Spirit of might. Spirit of knowledge, Spirit of the fear of the Lord. How many do we get? We get seven again. Spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. So again, this idea of seven is expressed in Isaiah and it's in relation to the Holy Spirit. So the salutation so far that we've read in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4 is from the Father, but also from the Spirit. Who's missing? Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 1, and we'll see. And that is, of course, in Revelation, let me pull up the next slide, Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we have the salutation from the Father and the Spirit. Then in verses 5 and 6, we have the salutation from Jesus Christ. And I want to note together how Jesus is identified. Hopefully you got your Bibles open there to that verse. Look with me as we see how he's identified to John's readers and to us. So Jesus Christ is identified first as the faithful witness. The word there, witness... The word there, witness, in Greek, is the same word that usually, that in English, we see as martyr, okay? That word martyr in English means someone who died for their faith. It means a witness, basically, in Greek. So we see it used um, in, the, in the book of Revelation uh, for others, but we see it here used of Jesus. He is the faithful witness. He is the faithful martyr. He gave a faithful testimony, that testimony, of course, culminated when he died on a cross. So Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He is also, however, the firstborn of the dead. I want us to notice that as well. He's the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Now, what does that mean in the context of Jesus? Does it mean he's the first one to be raised from the dead? No. Lazarus had been raised from the dead before Jesus, but when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he died again. Jesus is raised from the dead never to die again. He doesn't, he doesn't taste physical death again. His resurrection is different. It is of a different, completely different character than anyone who had been before him. And his resurrection, by the way, is the kind of resurrection we'll have when we're raised at the end of time. So Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He's the firstborn of the dead. That reminds us of that resurrection. And then, then the third part of that identification is that he is ruler of kings on earth. This is a great statement. You know, we read through the book of Revelation very, very quickly. We miss some of that. And that's a shame because this is a great statement of what Jesus did and who Jesus is. The faithful witness 
the one who was raised from the dead, and now he is ruler of kings on earth. A very appropriate identification, especially at the beginning of this book, where that is the message that's going to be emphasized, that Jesus Christ reigns. Remember, God wins, Satan loses. and We want to be on Jesus' side because he's the one, in, in truth, who is ruling. He's the ruler of kings on earth. Then we see further identification about Jesus, what he did. He loves us, the text tells us. This is the latter part of verse 5. He loves us, has freed us from our sins, and then finally in verse 6, made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. And so Jesus, this is who he is. This is what he did. This is Jesus in relation to us. He loves us. He freed us from our sins and he made us a kingdom, a priestly kingdom, his kingdom. And then finally, the verse six ends with a doxology. A doxology is a statement of praise. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 is a great little two verse section that tells us so much about Jesus and ends with that praise of him. There would be a great sermon preached out of verses 5 and 6 because it lends itself so well to the heart of the gospel and the heart of our relationship to Jesus Christ. Let's look on though. We've got about 13 minutes, and I definitely want to make sure we cover this last chart so we can finish up verses 7 and 8. So go ahead and look there in your Bibles. Verse 7, we're going to read, and then we're going to talk about it. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. So we get here in this very first chapter, in these opening verses, we get a statement of Jesus Christ coming in judgment. And that statement that we read there in verse 7 is actually composed of two Old Testament citations. They come from Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. They come from Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And we need to compare them to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. So let's do that together. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. This is what we read. I saw in the night visions, Daniel writes. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. I saw in the night visions and behold... With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. The one who is coming on the clouds here is not identified specifically except that he came, uh, he's like a son of man. It's referring to his human appearance. Who does he appear before? Who does he come to? The Ancient of Days. God the Father. So part of this citation we get in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 is coming straight out of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. The other part is from the book of Zechariah again, chapter 12 and verse 10. Let's read that. I'm going to give you time to find that. I want you to find that verse. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Find that verse and let's read this together. Uh, we don't usually go to Zechariah much in our teaching and preaching unless we have a class on the book. We find ourselves going there from the book of Revelation because, again, it's apocalyptic literature. They're coming from the same genre, and John is quoting through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's quoting from this Old Testament apocalyptic book. So Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me... On him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. Let me just say this. We didn't talk about this in the introduction. We're going to see it as we go through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is also a book that powerfully confirms the deity of Jesus Christ. Look at Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. The eye there is the Lord, Jehovah. It's Jehovah who's going to do this. And he says, when they look on me, on whom, on him whom they have pierced. 
who was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus Christ was pierced for our transgressions. And so he is identified through this quotation in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, coupled with the, quote, coupled with the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, with Jehovah. We're going to see a little bit more of this in just a moment. Now compare that to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. Chapter 24 and verse 30. This is talking about judgment on Jerusalem. This is what we read. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So they're going to see in the judgment on Jerusalem, Jesus coming in clouds and great glory, the son of man, and they will mourn. So as we see John weaving through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these Old Testament allusions and prophecies with New Testament allusions, which by the way are coming from the Old Testament as well, in the case of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30, we see the emphasis that he's placing upon Jesus coming in judgment. And it's here at the beginning of the verse. Now, as we look on, we've got one last verse to look at. So let's go ahead and go back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. Let's go ahead and take your Bibles and go back there. I'm going to click and get over there as well. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, we get the last phrase. It's a salutation that's going to conclude with the same thought as at the beginning. You get the whole note there all at once. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So you look at that. We saw that already once before. Where do we see that? We see that up there in verse... Let me give it to you. I want to get it right. It's in verse 4. Okay. So grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Down here in verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. So at the beginning of the salutation, verse 4, at the end of the salutation, we get this identification of God. This same form of identification is going to be used elsewhere, not of the Father, but of Jesus Christ. Look with me, if you would, Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13. In Revelation chapter 22, look with me at verse 13. There we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. If you have a red letter Bible, that red letter, those verses, that those words there are printed in red, aren't they? Because these are the words of Christ. We see that from the context of what's going on here in the passage. Okay, look with me. Uh, let's see, do we need to do that? He says, Behold, I am coming soon. Verse 12, beginning, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. All right, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Look with me at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17, this will make it even clearer that the speaker here is Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, when I saw him, John writes, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. So what does Jesus say? He says, I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Again, a powerful statement of the identity of Jesus Christ. Because in chapter 1, verses 4 and 8, it's the Father who is the first and the last. It's the Father who is the Alpha and the Omega. It's the Father who is and was and is to come. In Revelation 22 and verse 13, and in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18, it's Jesus speaking, and he says, I am the first and the last. He is identifying himself in these passages, in his own words, as deity. Well, it's 535, and I have finished the material for tonight. 
So if there are not any questions, if you've got one that you're just dying to type in, this is a good time to do it. Type it in on those comments so I can see it real quick while we're still streaming. You know, sometimes a class ends a little early. Sometimes it's going to end a little late. Sometimes there's so much to do, we have to move it into the next class and keep going that way. I've tried in this Revelation class to kind of break things down in such a way that we don't have to do that. So we're reading some small chunks. Uh, the result of that, of course, is that sometimes we're going to finish a little bit early. We're not going to go quite 40 minutes. But who knows, Wednesday night we may go 45 minutes or maybe even 50 minutes in order to cover the material. So I appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Let me pull up the next slide so that you know your homework. So here it is. It's a lot of homework, guys. If you have a Hark Rider book, look at Lesson 2. If you don't have a Hark Rider book, don't worry about it. Read Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. That's the last part. That's the rest of chapter 1. Okay, so that's like 11 verses. Okay, so here we go. I did get a question uh, from Anna. So Anna, your question is Colossians 1.15. I have to read it out loud because not everybody can see the comments. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 refers to Christ as the firstborn of all creation. How does that compare with the words used in Revelation chapter 1? That's a really good question, Anna, and I'm going to answer that question. We're now we're going to run a little bit longer for me to do that, and that's okay because we've got plenty of time tonight. So Revel uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, I'm going to go ahead and turn in my Bible over there, okay? Um, and you might want to do the same, Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15, this is what we read. Paul is talking about the preeminence of Christ. He says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Then verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So sometimes... Uh, you get that question. How is Jesus the firstborn of all creation? Part of that comes from our understanding of this idea of firstborn is that we think that firstborn means chronologically firstborn. What we find in the Old Testament, what we find in biblical language, is that that's generally the case. However, it's not always the case. Sometimes the one who was born first did not get to be the firstborn they get moved down the line. Someone who uh, was born later is actually moved to a position of being in the firstborn. So in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, what the language there is telling us is it's talking about position, talking about preeminence. So if you come to that verse and you say, well, that means Jesus was the first one created. No, because verse 16 tells us that's not the case. In verse 16, it says, for by him all things were created. If Jesus is a part of creation, then he would have had to create himself. Jesus is outside of creation. So by him, all things are created. And then it enumerates what all those are. Verse 17, he says, he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. So not only does he create everything, he keeps it, he keeps it going. Okay, he keeps that together. Now, if you look down in verse 18, he says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. There's that phrase again, that in everything he might be preeminent. So Jesus, when we go back, let me see, I'm going to pull that slide back up. Let's see if I can get that slide. There we go. So here we have Jesus Christ being firstborn of the dead. And what I indicated, remember, was that he was not the first one to be raised, but he was the first one to be raised never to die again. In that he has preeminence. So the phrase here in Revelation chapter 1 is about preeminence in relation to the type of resurrection. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, it's a reference to preeminence in the context of the created world and his rule over it. So I hope that answers your question, Anna. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Anna is my daughter. And so I'm sure that if it did not answer her question, she'll let me know and she and I will talk about that some more. If, if it didn't answer your question, if you looked at that and said, ah, I don't, that doesn't really answer my question, let me know. We'll talk about it some more. All right. Um, thank you for that question. Any other questions tonight before we, let me pull up that slide again so that you have the assignment before we conclude the live stream. All right, so again, homework for Wednesday night. Wednesday night's class starts at 7 p.m. 
We're going to study Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. So read that in advance. Take a little notebook if you've got one. If you've got some questions that you go through and you see those verses, write those questions down. Jot them down. And that way, when we talk about them Wednesday night, you'll say, aha, I remember I had a question about that. You'll type it in the comments and we'll talk about it. All right. I appreciate everybody tuning in this evening.